Welcome to ProBuild 360. And if you're like me, you would never dream that all of these interiors were inside the outside facade. It's amazing. But, and a great hub for, for an evening on arts and interiors. But before I say any more, and I introduce Brian, who I know everybody's here to, to listen to, I'm going to hand you over to Michael from ProBuild 360, who will explain just a little bit more about this very exciting hub. Hello. Hi everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, just wanted to really uh, introduce what's going on tonight. So obviously, thank you so much to Brian for coming out this evening um, and hanging these lovely things on our walls, our, our plain white walls and bringing some color into our lives. Um, yeah, this is ProBuild 360. Um, um, we just want to sort of extend our invitation to everyone here to um, think of this place as somewhere that we can uh, do business and have fun and be in a great environment where everything looks beautiful, is comfortable and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, that's it really. I uh, want to introduce Gail from um, uh, Litchfield Safe Centre. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Hello, everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening. Um, my husband and I are Litchfield Safe Centre and we work in partnership with uh, ProBuild. Um, so we do luxury safes and gun cabinets, so please come and see us. Um, we've been doing uh, traditional safes for about 28 years now. Obviously, we started when we were three. And, um, you know, we are really excited to be working with these guys. I'm sure you'll agree what a beautiful place and some beautiful artwork. And I'm going to pass on to this young gentleman over here. Oh, no, it's actually Katie, so I do apologize. <laughs> No, you're more than welcome. I know he's far more interesting than I am, so I'll forgive you. <laughs> so tonight, we have Brian Travers with us, who was the founding member of UB40. Yeah. And so we're going to do a bit of a Q&A about his career and his art. And should we get you another microphone so we don't have to fight over it? Because I'm sure you'd win. Yeah, you're going to be here for a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's time you're never going to get back. So get right. comfortable, OK? OK. So before we talk about your art, Let's talk Thank about you. your chair. incredible career. Thank you very much, darling. He knows she I was dancing sure at the weekend. Yeah. Bridesmaid's <laughs> duties, my feet are killing me. Um, yeah, <laughs> one, yeah. So one going. Hello, everybody. Can I just say it's a real privilege to be here. I'm, I'm really quite humbled. And thanks to Tammy and Bar 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 and what a beautiful place. And uh, if you get bored, there's a bedroom over there. You can go and have a kip. Can if I just say... Hot, there's a shower and a bathroom in there for the girls, no blokes. Can I just say, and, uh, he asked for the seats and he's not sitting. I'm there sitting you go. There. <laughs> so let's talk about, before we talk about your art, let's talk about your career in UB40. Okay. Because a group of school friends in a cellar, practicing your signatures on the wall, That's sweeping right. leaves out. Did you ever imagine that would turn into 70 million records sold worldwide? Actually, a lot more records than that. But... I mean, that's just my, that's just because I'm a big head that I'm saying it, but that, that 70 million was in about 1990, you know. And my God. Yeah. You say you're rich? I was, yeah. <laughs> no, I was. Uh, I'm extravagant. And, uh, yeah, you know, we've done all right. We've done great. You know, in many ways, it was a, it's a, year before it was the first band any of us were in, and we were school friends. Most of us went to the Mosley Road School of Art it, oh. in Borswell Heath on okay. the Mosley Road. And the only class we didn't have was music lessons. And, and as teenagers, you, you, you generally want to do everything that you're not doing or not allowed to do. And we wanted to be pop stars. And, you know, I'm a ginger. You know what I mean? I wanted a girlfriend. I thought, if I get on top of the pops, <laughs> maybe. You know? <laughs> but uh, we were incredibly lucky. And we, we, we were really confident because we believed in what we, did, we were but doing. And, uh, why reggae? How did it come to be reggae? Well, I mean, if you, if, if you knocked about or lived in Borsal or Mosley, in the in the mid 70s and 80s that was the music we listened to you know that was there, there was glam rock music you know in the okay where you wear your sister's blouse and your mom's makeup <laughs> i'm still Borsa doing Leaf, that by the way in borsal <laughs> no in borsal and, and around mosley we were more what we used to call uh townies i don't know if anybody remembers that term it was like a bit past skin edge not, not the fascist ones the original fashion we were a bit too young for that and it was you know, like moe trousers and ben sherman shirts and and soul music and Tamla and, and Studio One and, and reggae music, Rocksteady and Ska and Bluebeats. So that was, I, th I think any young guy starting a band, you always try and emulate the music that you listen to. And they're your heroes. And our heroes were Desmond Decker 
and Prince Buster and Bob Marley. He was young when we got into it, you know. He, he came later, the reggae thing. But we tried to emulate the music we listened to. We didn't, you know, it was, we weren't trying to be exotic or, or anything. Half the guys, their heritage and their families were from Jamaica anyway. I'm from an Irish family. I mean, we're kind of like the United yeah. Nations of Borsalif in many <laughs> ways. And, uh, no, no, really, but I don't think that's a different story to any, any of us in this room now. If you think of your school friends, we were from all over the place. And, and the thing and was, you didn't have a wealthy upbringing, none of you. Yeah. So what was it like that, no. when you were travelling the world and well, uh, crowds uh, screaming sure. for you and well, that's passport kind of stamps in the passport? Yeah, it's kind of crazy, yeah. We hadn't been anywhere till we were in a band. To be honest, you know, and first fl aeroplanes we went on when we were, when we we had a hit record, and uh, it was incredible. It, it it feels like about five minutes since we started, thirty seven years ago, and it's still incredibly exciting. And and wherever you go, see, no, I don't think anybody buys a ticket to go to a gig they don't want to go to. I don't think anybody goes to a record shop and buys a record they don't want. So when they do buy a record or come to your gig, they're really happy that you're there and. Treat you, I mean, with far too much respect, really. You know, it, it, was, it was really, yeah, we were treated better than we should have been because we were kids who knew nothing. But it's been an incredible education and every day's a school day, as we all know, as, as we get older. And, uh, and it's still the same. And, and this year, in, in a few minutes, I'm going to Australia and New Zealand and, yeah. and the Far East. And so it just continues. Three and a half decades of music. Is yeah. there an era or a time period where that was your favourite? You really liked what you produced? Because it has changed slightly over the years, hasn't it? It's, it's, thank God for that. I mean, if it didn't change, in all fairness, we'd still be listening to uh, Bob Monkhouse or, I don't know, Jez O'Connor or Max Bygraves. If it didn't change, it has to change. Young people. This is the only, it's, youth culture is the only control young people have. I don't have any money, but they can decide what they like, what fashion they like and what music they like. And I think that's the greatest thing. It's a, you know, and I still believe in it. And I don't mind being an old fart now. I don't mind being a guy <laughs> who's, you know, the only time I realise I'm old, when I'm having a shave or brushing my teeth, I think, fucking hell, who's that 70 year old ghost in the mirror, you know? <laughs> We, we all suffer from well, it. You, you need to say, or oh, when you're sitting next to me, that would have been really nice. <laughs> but don't let yeah, me make you no, say no, absolutely <laughs> come here you give us a kiss absolutely but um no you, you suffer from an arrested development if you work in the arts especially in music i mean when i'm on stage i don't think i'm a granddad walking across the stage and dancing like an uncle at a wedding do you know i think i'm 16 and the most fantastic place in the buddha Khan or at wembley stadium do you know but of course it's okay it's all all right, you know. It's been a wonderful life doing this. And like I say, everybody's always nice, you know. And, uh, and you, you're quite happy to talk about, because you before 40 fell out, we all know that, it's quite documented. No, there's brothers but in the band, two brothers fell yeah. out. But and the one brother left. What I don't what think happened. people realise, but you were the main songwriter, yet you were happy to share all the royalties, weren't you? Well, that's, that was the deal we had. It, it a, you know, you, you hear of one hit wonders. And you make a record, and if that million to one chance you have a hit, it takes about a year, 18 months, for the, for the royalties to finally pay through. And then the songwriter, which is generally the singer, he turns up in a Ferrari, and everybody else is catching the bus to rehearsals, and that's when the band splits up, about 18 months. But we were all friends from school days. We were friends from 11 years old, from secondary school. You know, We went to Mosey Road School of Arts, and um, we decided there and then that we were, hello, Karen. I saw her in Spain two nights ago. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's a shock. I thought it was only me and that fascist who had to work this hard, moving around the world. <laughs> Sorry, um, what were we saying? <laughs> you were school friends, so you were school friends. We were school friends, and, and, and we really did. You know, you can't take yourself too seriously in, in the arts or in show business, but you must take what you do seriously. And because we were all friends, we could all remember when Katie Cox all beat one of them up when we were eight. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Or when people were crying because their mum told them to come in, it's way past their bedtime. <laughs> you get, so you can't reinvent yourselves. And, uh, and so our egos were really kept in shape. I think a lot of bands are formed when the singer-songwriter or the guy writing the songs auditions for a drummer and a, and a guitarist and all these strangers come together and then they become a bit famous. They go, yeah, I was always like this. It's always, you know, I've manifested my will on the world. Yeah. And they reinvent themselves.
Do you think and we weren't the... allowed to do that. And uh, so in turn, we never took ourselves seriously. And, um, and that's why we split everything with each other. And, uh, do and you it's think the best that way. was the golden age of music? Because I've talked no. to jo- Bon John Jovi and people like that, and they actually think that it was. They were good days. Well, they said it, it was more opinions are like arseholes, aren't they? We've all yeah. got one. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm saying? And John's a lovely guy, and I've met him a few times. He's not me, I haven't got his phone number, but he's a lovely fella, and uh, if he thinks that, that's great. But I think the best music's still to come, you know, and, uh, and I think every, every, every genre of music that goes down, it's very serendipitous. He opens the doors for younger musicians, and they can research a past. You know, you can, you can do like a PhD in music, when you, by the time you're 17 years old, if you really love music, you can go back and see the source of where all this... You know, reggae comes from Rocksteady and Bluebeat. And Scar's a later thing, and reggae's much later, you know, and, and rock and roll comes from R&B, and you can trace it all back. I think the best stuff is still to come. And I know that in this room, somebody will know somebody who's a musical genius. They just don't know that themselves yet, you know. And that's, uh, a, that's a lovely thing. And there's only 12 notes, you know, and that's all there is. Uh, but then there's only seven numbers on the lottery, isn't there? Oh. Do, you know, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Try and get them, right? So. But if you guess enough, you know, if you, if you guess enough times, you're going to get something right eventually. If you believe it, if you don't take yourself too seriously. But, you know, we, you, you, we're all fallible. You've got to get, we get things wrong and it's okay. It's okay to fail, you know. So you've nailed the music career and now art. What made you transition well, into... Well, I always painted. I went to art school when I was 11. That's where, where you, yeah. where guys and you before you met. So that was your first love over music? Yeah. I was, a, I was a kid in class who could draw the best dinosaur when we were 10. Do you get what I'm saying? That's only because... That was never me. So that's I only because I, spent, I had ginger hair. I spent a lot of time on my own just, <laughs> just drawing in the ice on the inside of my windows in my bedroom. Do you remember that? Who remembers waking up and there was ice inside your, your bedroom? Your, before central eating and carpets. Before and Pro Build 360 time. That before was. Pro Build 360. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, you know, I just, I just love drawing. I mean, anybody can draw and paint, but you can't do it the first time you try. It's like music. You, you have to do it and get it wrong. And, and then and I've never minded getting something wrong to learn a lesson, you know. And yeah. You get something wrong once, you rarely get it wrong a second time, you know. And... Uh, so, and it's just a nice pastime, it doesn't hurt anybody, like music. Music, the most abstract of all the art forms. You can't see, you can't touch it, but it touches all of us in some way. Even if I hate that record, or I love that record, but music touches us all. And, uh, and art is the same thing. So what I inspires your pieces? Because you've painted Muhammad Ali and we know that you, you, you know, yeah. he's a hero well, of yours. Well I did that when he passed away. Though, yeah, you know, but what inspires your work? I think just life, just... just uh, just trying to stay interested in people. And, and uh, you know, a thing like tonight, I've met so many people. I've met Martin and Paul, uh, oh God, I got that name wrong. And I usually get them all right. Philippa, the bride. Oh man, no, I, I like meeting people. I, I suppose I'm over gregarious, but I meet 44,000 people every day in my business, playing gigs. And with all the lines of security, you're lucky if you actually get to shake somebody's hand, you know, and, and that's not to do with the bands and the acts not wanting to meet anybody. It's to do with the venues, wanting to get everybody out after the show's finished so they can go home. You know, do, do you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and I, so you, I was just going to say, your, your art hangs on walls in Marbella. It's very collectible in New York, isn't it, in Dubai? Well, so yeah. it hangs all over the world. How does that make in you Naples, feel? in Florida, we've we got an exhibition with the Mary Martin Gallery, one of the biggest yeah. galleries in the US. And um, in Miami, at the Oliver Cole Gallery. And in Charleston, South Carolina, it's beautiful, delicate little southern town basically where the civil war started I think, really you know and uh, it's still the people are beautiful and it's, it's real nice to be there we go all over the world we were in marbella two nights ago she'll tell you we had a right knees up didn't we <laughs> he's still drunk <laughs> he's still drunk from there but, uh, we had a good <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah we got stuff all over the place but you know they say there's no place like home and tonight we're in aston and I'm from just the other side of the city, you know, we've just come from the other so side. So it feels good. But it's still Birmingham, we're still at home, and uh, I'm making some friends this evening. And can I just say, every, if you haven't, you probably haven't noticed, it's any small, but in that section there, where, where the silver lights are hanging down, you'll see a microscope. As a friend of ours, his name's Willard Wiggins, he's from Wolverhampton, he's, he's about my age. And he's the world's only nano artist. And he works on a microscopic level. 
and he makes sculptures and puts them inside the eye of a needle. I'm not talking about darning needles, I'm talking about needles that big. And if you, if you have a look, there's a little microscope and there's a silver button on top. If you press a button, it lights it up and you'll see one of those roundel paintings, those red, gold and green pictures inside the eye of a needle. And, uh, and there's a little book at the side. So if you, if you only do it for a minute, just have a look. Press the silver button and have a look at this guy's work. Because we're know. very lucky to have that piece here, actually, because there's only so many pieces in the world, isn't there? And sure, yeah. yeah. Well, so I, I, he gave it me. It seize the moment. So I brought it along tonight. But try and have a look. Just, just to amaze yourself how somebody can work at this nano level. And he has to cut the do his paint strokes or cuts. He does sculptures. He's done The Last Supper in the eye of a needle. And even put Mary Magdalene in there. Do you know what I mean? He's added an extra cake to it. And he has to cut in between heartbeats. So he puts his hand on his heart. And when his heart's beat, then he cuts. Because otherwise, he just cuts them all in half, you know. But, yeah. but try, and, <laughs> try and have a look if you can. It's, it's, it's really quite interesting. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it makes a mockery of what I do. Aww. I throw paints around at things. And I just have fun with it, you know, as a... I'd like to keep it, you know, friendly and, and playful. Do you have to be in a certain mood to paint? Are you one of these artists yeah. that's got to be in a certain mindset? And Well, different mindsets for different work. I tend to paint on my own at two o'clock in the morning, and for, you know, for, for the wee hours, because there's no, nobody around. And I, I'm, my, my life's involved, as I say, I meet 44,000 people every day. It's involved, as a group, it's like a group sport, you know, with a big band. You know, people get pissed off if you for breathing. You know, I mean, somebody plays a bad night, oh, that ruins the day. But this is just me and the work. So, you know, I'm still finding myself. I'm only 50. I've only been doing it for 40 years. I'm still looking for myself. But I've kind of painted people who I love. I love Mamad Ali. I love Pele. And I love David Bowie. And I played with him. I mean, one of the greatest things in my life. We played gigs together. And I played on stage with him. And he was the most fantastic, funny bloke in the world that you probably wouldn't have got from his public image. But he was always playing a part. He was a reg dead regular South London Brixton guy and a real nice fella. And, uh, and Mohammed Ali, you know, it's no explanation, does he? If you're going to have a hero, my hero has to be the guy who said, I'm not going to Vietnam to hurt anybody who's done nothing to me. And he was scared of nothing. He was a world heavyweight number one. He wasn't frightened of nothing, I, I can imagine. And uh, that's the kind of guy who's my hero, you know. And, uh, Here's a question for you. It's quite a tricky one, really, because it's almost like asking if you've got a favourite child. But do you have yes. a favourite song? <laughs> I'm hoping I'm on my mum's nah, favourite. Nah. Um, do you have a favourite song that you've written and a favourite painting that you've, you've painted? Oh, wow. Well, you know, in, with songs, it's always the last one I've done because by the time we've recorded a song, so we've written it, gone through working the arrangement, rehearsing it, recording it, mixing it, mastering it, and then by the time it comes out, I've heard it 44,000 times. So it's generally the latest stuff that I'm working on. But, you know, I'm proud of the ones that were kind of giant hits around the world. You know. <laughs> and you what know. about the paintings? paintings? Muhammad Ali has got to be a favourite of yours. Uh, wait, wait, you know, I wouldn't let anybody see anything that I painted that I didn't believe in. So, you know, these pictures, are, there's, there's a few pictures of Muhammad Ali there. There's more. My favourite one isn't actually here tonight. We, we sold it to a guy called Damien Delaney. He was a, he was a captain of Crystal Palace. Fantastic footballer from Cork in Ireland, really lovely fella. And uh, he bought it, didn't he? And he bought some original David Bowie pictures. But um, when I was painting, you see the profile of Muhammad Ali there. At one point, he looked like Lenny Henry. Then it went to Eddie Murphy. <laughs> At one point, we nearly got to like Nelson Mandela. And if you look around his face, you can see where I was rubbing stuff out. And I think that's where, that's where I found him, yeah. But you don't see the stuff that I'm not keen on. I wouldn't show you anything I wasn't keen on. I like to think of myself as an abstract artist. In as much, you know, if it's not abstract, it's not art. The portraits and stuff, it's, that's for me. It's, it either looks like a person or it doesn't. And, and that's the easiest thing to do if it doesn't look like him. Keep doing it till he does, you know, rub it out. Don't show anyone. It's the abstract art. I, I, I want to do something that nobody's done before, really, you know. And, uh, and, and to wrap it up, because I know a lot of people actually want some Forget about it, you're time. not wrapping it up yet. Yeah. No, no, the no, other no, no, day, no, I've got one question, I've got, got one question. You're going nowhere that quick, but um, you're off on tour again. Tell us a little bit about, about the places you're taking in and the, the type of gigs, because like you say, you like more intimate gigs now as well, where you Absolutely. have a chance to, well, not we touch the, the toughest audience. Gigs but to play. Yeah. The toughest gigs to play are, are to small audiences where you, you stand in this close, where people can, you can hear people say, get off. <laughs> 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 no, no. 
I mean, you know, you, you play big joints and it probably from, from here to the back of the room, there's space in front of the stage and that's, that's kind of tough to communicate. The nicest gigs are the smallest, but they're the hardest ones. Yeah. And you've got to be the realest that you can be. But, but we continue, we played for 37 years and we were about to leave for Australia and New Zealand. And then we come back in December and we got gigs in, you know, the arenas in, in the UK. What's it called? The NEC now? The yeah, Genting, that little place. The Genting yeah. Arena, LG, something. Yeah. We're playing there. There's December. nothing intimate about that one. <laughs> no, exactly. It's still great to play. You know, you know it, it, it doesn't hurt anybody. Nobody has to come, nobody comes to a gig that they want to go to. Mm. So we always have a great time. And, it's, and to, it, it really is a privilege to be able to do that. I mean, you're all putting up with me now, and thank you. And it's embarrassing to leave while I'm talking, because I can see you, isn't it? <laughs> right? But it, it truly is. This is a real privilege, is having this opportunity. And I know it doesn't sound like it, but I'm really quite shy. If we weren't, if Katie wasn't helping me out here, it'd be, it'd be more difficult to do this. And uh, more of a hindrance than a help yeah. to him, because he wants to keep flowing. But listen, it's been a privilege having you here tonight. But I before think you everybody finish, will agree with that, won't they? Before you finish, the important. Yeah. So my mate said to me the other day, what's the only food stuff that can make you cry? And I says, and she says, an onion. So I smashed him in the face with a coconut. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's not very funny. <laughs> He's heard that joke about 600 times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I'm sure if anybody wants to talk to him about his art or approach him about his music, Please, yeah. Brian is here tonight. Happy to mingle and chat, take photos with everybody. So round of applause for him. I think. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. You look fantastic. I wasn't meant to talk. Thank you so much. Real privilege. Thank you. Thanks, guys.